part eight, The Hobbit. We are on the chapter, A Short Rest, and we are hearing some song. Oh, what are you doing and where are you going? Your ponies need shoeing. The river is flowing. Oh, tra-la-la-la-la-la, here down in the valley. Oh, what are you seeking and where are you making? The faggots are reeking, the bannocks are baking. Oh, trillillillally, the valley is jolly. Ha ha! Oh, where are you going with your beards all a wagging? And what brings Mr. Baggins and Ballin and Dwallin down in the valley in June? Ha ha! Oh, will you be staying or will you be flying? Your ponies are straying, the daylight is dying. To fly would be folly, to stay would be jolly, and listen and hark till the end of the dark to our hootoon. Ha ha! So they laughed and sang in the trees, and a pretty fair nonsense, I dare say you think it. Not that they would care, they would only laugh all the more if you told them so. They were elves, of course. Soon Bilbo caught glimpses of them as the darkness deepened. He loved elves, though he seldom met them, but he was a little frightened of them, too. Dwarves don't get along well with them. Even decent dwarves like Thorin and his friends think them foolish, which is a very foolish thing to think, or get annoyed with them, for some elves tease them and laugh at them, and most of all at their beards. Well, well, said a voice, just look. Bilbo the Hobbit on a pony, my dear. Isn't it delicious? Most astonishing, wonderful. Then off they went into another song as ridiculous as the one I have written down in full. At last, one, a tall young fellow, came out of the trees and bowed before Gandalf and to Thorin. Welcome to the valley, he said. Thank you, said Thorin, a bit gruffly, but Gandalf was already off his horse and among the elves, talking merrily with them. You are a little out of your way, said the elf. That is, if you are making for the only path across the water and to the house beyond. We will set you right, but you had best get on foot until you go over the bridge. Are you going to stay a bit and sing with us, or will you go straight on? Supper is preparing over there, he said. I can smell the wood fires for the cooking. Tired as he was, Bilbo would have liked to have stayed a while. Elvish singing is not a thing to miss in June under the stars, not if you care for such things. Also, he would have liked to have a few private words with these people that seemed to know his names and all about him, though he had never seen them before. He thought their opinion of his adventurer might be interesting. Elves know a lot and are wondrous folks for news and know what is going on among the peoples of the land quick as the water flows, or quicker. But the dwarves were all for supper as soon as possible just then and would not stay. On they all went, leading their ponies, till they were brought to a good path, so at last to the very brink of the river. It was flowing fast and noisily as mountain streams do on a summer evening, when the sun being all day on the snow far up above. There was only a narrow bridge of stone without a parapet, as narrow as a pony could walk on. And over that they had to go, slow and carefully, one by one, each leading his pony by the bridle. The elves had brought bright lanterns to the shore, and they sang a merry song as the party went across. Don't dip your beard in the foam, father, they cried to Thorin, who was bent almost to his hands and knees. It is long enough without watering it. Mine Bilbo doesn't eat all the cakes, they called. He is too fat to get through keyholes yet. Hush, hush, good people and good night, said Gandalf, who came last. Valleys have ears and some elves have over-merry tongues. Good night. And so at last they came to the last homely house and found its doors flung wide. 
Now, it is a strange thing, but things that are good to have and days that are good to spend are soon told about and not much to listen to, while things that are uncomfortable, palpitating, and even gruesome may make a good tale, they take a good, of telling, good deal of telling anyway. They stayed long in that good house, fourteen days at least, and they found it hard to leave. Bilbo would have gladly stopped there for ever and ever, ever supposing a wish that have taken him right back, even supposing a wish would have taken him right back to his hobbit hole without trouble. Yet there is little to tell about their stay. The master of the house was elf, an elf friend, one of the people whose fathers came into strange stories before the beginning of history. The wars of the evil goblins and the elves and the first men in the north. In those days our tales were still some people who had both elves and the heroes of the north for ancestors. And Elrond, the master of the house, was their chief. He was a noble and fair in face as an elf lord, as strong as a warrior, as wise as a wizard, as venerable as a king of dwarves, as kind. As summer. He comes into many tales, but his part in the story of Bilbo's great adventure is only a small one, though important, as you will see, if ever we get to the end of it. His house was perfect whether you liked food, or sleep, or work, or storytelling, or singing, or just sitting and thinking best, or a pleasant mixture of them all, evil things did not come into that valley. I wish I had time to tell you even a few of the tales, one or two of the songs that I heard in that house. All of them, the ponies as well, grew refreshed and strong in a few days there. Their clothes were mended as well, and their bruises were and tempers, as well as their hopes, were all mended. Their bags were filled with food and provisions light to carry, but strong to bring them over the mountain passes. Their plans were improved with the best advice. So the time came for the Midsummer's Eve, and they were to go on again with the early sun of the Midsummer morning. Elrond knew all about runes of every kind. The day he looked at the swords they brought him from the troll's lair, he said, These are not troll make. They are old swords, very old. The high elves of the west, my kin. They were made in Gondolin for the goblin wars. They must have come from a dragon's hoard or goblin plunder, for dragons and goblins destroyed that city many ages ago. This Thorin, the rune's name Orcrist, the goblin cleaver in the ancient tongue of, Go of Gondolin, it was a famous blade. This Gandalf was glamdring foe hammer that the king of Gondolin once wore. Keep them well. Whence did trolls get them, I wonder, said Thorin, looking at his sword with new interest. I could not say, said Elrond, but one may guess that your trolls have plundered other plunderers, or come on remnants of old robberies in some hole in the mountains of old. I have heard that there are still forgotten treasures of old, either be found in the deserted caverns of the mines of Moria since the dwarf and the goblin war. Thor pondered these words. I will keep this sword in honor, he said. May it soon clean, cleave goblins once again. A wish that is likely to be granted enough in the mountains, said Elrond. But show me your map. He took it and gazed long, and he shook his head, for he did not altogether approve of dwarves and their love of gold. He hated dragons and their cruel wickedness, and he grieved to remember the ruin of the town of Dale and its merry bells, and the burned banks of the bright river running. The moon was shining in a broad silver crescent. He held up the map when with the white light shone through it. What is this? he said. 
There are moon letters here beside the plain runes, which says, Five feet high the door, and three may walk abreast. What are moon letters? said Hobbit, full of excitement. He loved maps, as I have told you before, and he also liked runes and letters and cunning handwriting, though when he wrote himself, it was a bit thin and spidery. Moon letters are rune letters, but you cannot see them, said Elrond, not when you look straight at them. They can only be seen when the moon shines through them. And, what is more, those of a more cunning sort must be a moon of the same shape and season as the day they were written. The dwarves invented them and wrote them with silver pins, as your friends could tell you. They must have been written on a midsummer's eve on a crescent moon a long while ago. What? do they say? asked Gandalf and Thorin together, a bit vexed perhaps that Elrond should have found this out first, though really there was not a chance before, and there would not be another until goodness knows when. Stand by the grey stone when the thrush knocks, read Elrond, and the setting sun on the last light of Durin's day will shine upon the keyhole. Durin? Durin, said Thorin, he was the father of the father of the eldest race of dwarves, the Longbeards, my first ancestor. I am his heir. Then what is Durin's day, said Elrond? The first day of the dwarves' new year, said Thorin, is all should know the first day of the last moon of autumn is the threshold of winter. We still call it Durin's day, when the last moon of autumn and the sun are in the sky all together. But this will not help us much, I fear, for it passes our skill in these days to guess when such a time will come again. That remains to be seen, said Gandalf. Is there any more writing? Not to be seen by this moon, said Elrond, and he gave the map back to Thorin. And then they went down to the water to see the elves dance and sing upon the Midsummer's Eve. The next morning was a Midsummer's morning as fair and fresh as could be dreamed. Blue sky and never a cloud and the sun dancing on the water. Now they rode away amid songs of farewell and good speed, with their hearts ready for more adventure, and with the knowledge of the road they must follow over the misty mountains to the lands beyond. Chapter 4 Over Hill and Under Hill There are many paths that lead up into the mountains, and many passes over them. But most of the paths were cheats and deceptions that led to nowhere or to bad ends. And most of the passages were infested by evil things and dreadful dangers. The dwarves and hobbits, helped by the wise advice of Elrond and the knowledge and the memory of Gandalf, took the right road to the right pass. Long days after they climbed out of the valley and left the last homely house miles behind, they were still going up and up and up. It was a hard path and a dangerous path, a crooked way and a long, lonely and long. Now they could look back over the lands they had left, laid out before them far below, far, far away in the west, where things were blue and faint. Bilbo knew there lay his own country of safe and comfortable things, and his little hobbit hole. He shivered. It was getting bitter cold up here, and the wind came shrill among the rocks. Boulders, too, at times came galloping down the mountain sides, let loose by midday sun upon the snow, and passed among them, which was very lucky, or over their heads, which was alarming. The nights were comfortless and chill, and they did not dare to sing or talk too loud, 
for the echoes were uncanny, and the silence seemed to dislike being broken, except by the noise of water and the wail of wind and the crack of stone. The summer's getting on down below, thought Bilbo, and haymaking is going on and picnics. They'll be harvesting and blackberrying before we even begin to go down at the other rate. And the others were thinking equally gloomy thoughts. Although they had said goodbye to Elrond in high hope of midsummer morning, they had spoken gaily of the passage of the mountains and the riding swift across the lands beyond. They had thought of coming to the secret door in the lonely mountain, perhaps at the very first moon of autumn, and perhaps it will be Durin's day, they had said. Only Gandalf had shaken his head and said nothing. Dwarves had not passed this way for many years, but Gandalf had. He knew how evil and danger had grown and thriven in the wild since the dragon had driven men from these lands, and the goblins had spread in secret after the battle of the mines of Moria. Even the good plans of wise wizards like Gandalf and good friends like Elrond go astray sometimes when you are off in the dangerous adventures over the edge of the wild, and Gandalf was wise enough wizard to know it. And there we end part eight. And if you want to find out what happens to them in the Misty Mountains, tune in for part nine. Thank you for watching Roll Play Right.